Hello. Oh, it does work. Great. You, you comfy there? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to start. Hello. I'm going to do a very Irish apology here, and uh, particularly coming from myself, apologize for starting on time, because we do have a packed session. Um, so, take off the glasses too so I can see what I've written. Um, my name is Orm McCarthy, and I am delighted to welcome you here to what is probably PSI's first full symposium on psychological issues as they relate to climate change. And I was really delighted to hear climate change being discussed earlier and yesterday by our two excellent keynote speakers. And just to kind of cover what might we have in store for you, well, we have five different papers. I won't read them out to you. They're all um, hopefully cleared up there on the slide in front of you. And covering a diverse range of climate change related topics. I really do hope you find them top of folking and even more importantly, maybe, behaviour changing. And guiding us through this afternoon's proceeding is our chairperson, Merica, who's also a very active committee member of our special interest group. And hopefully, if our, all our speakers can keep to their time allocation, never an easy task, we'll have time for questions and answers to finish out the symposium. So, whoop, next slide. If I could take a moment to introduce our newly established special interest group, it is a fairly lengthy title, Addressing Climate and Environmental Emergency. And the impetus for setting up this thing happened over a cup of coffee between myself and Owen Gallivan, who's here on my right on the SIG secretary and one of today's presenters. Late last year, when we accidentally discovered we had a growing concern about the direction and future impact of climate change. So, we started out engaging with PSI about setting up a SIG with a few goals in mind. We wanted to develop a SIG whose activities would have a clear public benefit that would, involve, would be involved in raising awareness of climate change and the environment, environmental emergency it represented, and to consider how psychology could help us understand our reactions and even more importantly, our inactions to these serious issues. And as a SIG, we also considered various ideas that we thought were very important in directing our thinking on this issue. So, the importance of the social, cultural, and political context in which we live and operate, and the significant influences these bring to bear. Then there's the idea of climate justice, which is the interplay of climate change and social justice, and the view that everyone deserves equal economic, political, and social rights and opportunities. Then there was the idea of just transition, and in our context, the idea of greening our economy in a way that is fair and inclusive to everyone involved, creating decent work opportunities, and most importantly, leaving nobody behind. And then there was the idea of nature-based interventions and nature-based solutions. Oops. 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 Oh, there they all are there. <laughs> and that wasn't, wasn't working. So, now we be crystal clear if I can. Climate change is real, and it is bad, and there is no planet B. That is, unless Elon Musk manages to terraform Mars in the next 10 years and whisk us all up there. And as you know, there is no shortage of scientific papers available attesting to how real and scary climate change is becoming. The UN, for the first time, waded into discussion with its recently published paper called Global Assessment Report on Disaster Risk Reduction, bit of a mouthful. This paper, which has been described by insiders as, and I quote, an eviscerated skeleton, a fairly graphic description, a paper that apparently had to be watered down for public consumption, such was the seriousness of its findings. The paper tentatively suggests that four of the nine planetary boundaries, or tipping points, have already been passed. The Stockholm Resilience Centre, who are the authors of this framework, claim that in reality, six 
of the planetary boundaries have already been passed. And the conclusion of the UN report is that if we fail to act, and again I quote, total societal collapse is a possibility. Finally, for those who've been following the news recently on the COP27, which is co-occurring with our conference, the UN Secretary General, no doubt informed by this particular paper, has bluntly stated that humanity is on, again I quote, a highway to climate hell with our foot on the accelerator. And we have no choice but to cooperate or perish. And on that grim note, I'll hand you over to America. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marika Casarino. I'm chairing this session. And just to note, we will have uh, five presentations. We will just go on with all the presentations and keep a Q&A at the end, if, if that is OK. So um, I might invite now Dr. Ongalun to talk about why we are stuck. Reflections on the psychology of inaction. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming along. Uh, it's really grim, isn't it? Uh, when I started thinking about this um, more deeply about a year or so ago, I kind of knew about it psychologically, you know, as an intellectual thing. Yeah, climate crisis, and it's there. But it hadn't really gotten under my skin. In other words, I hadn't really felt anything about it. And then I did start feeling things about it. And that was quite an overwhelming experience, and it took me a while to kind of gather myself. So this happens to me, as I've said there, I'm a psychologist and a dad. This happened to me as a father first, and a psychologist second. So this got under my skin as a human being way more than it did as a psychologist, but as I kind of came to terms with it, I realized, hold on a second, there's a psychology at play here that's worth articulating, and maybe psychologists have a role to play. Before I start going into the kind of the, the detail of some of the psychology that might be salient and might be relevant, um, did that work? It did. Uh, some really important contextual aspects that I'm not going to go into in detail, but they are really important, so just to note them. Uh, things like our historical context of colonialism, philosophical dualism, a cultural context, things like consumerism, uh, an economic con context, capitalism, and a political context, neoliberalism or even ultra-neoliberalism. And all of these things are deeply socializing in their impact and habituation on us. And why are you jumping ahead? I'm not ready for you. Go back. Um, and kind of emphasize a resource extraction relationship with the natural world. So these are really powerful forces that have existed for decades that have a profound influence on how we think and relate to the climate crisis. So they're there. I'm not going to go into any more detail on them. This is a really good book if you want to further your understanding. Now I'm ready for you. There you go. So what happens when we see messages like this? When a message comes at us that says the Earth is firmly on track towards an unlivable world, when the UN says this, this isn't you know, just some guy in the pub, this is the UN, right? This is the collective scientific knowledge of the human race being expressed here. The coming food catastrophe, UN warns of the potential for total societal collapse. What happens to the way we process that information? What do we do with it? A lot of the time, it bounces right off. It just kind of, bing, I can't cope with that. So Perhaps and Stonks is a Norwegian psychologist who's come up with a model, a way of thinking about when this information comes at us, what are the kind of psychological reactions that we have that allow us to not stick with it, not pay attention to it, in a sense. So things like psychological distance. It's not me, it's the polar bears. It's not me, it's people in Pakistan. It's not me, it's the next generation. I don't have to deal with it now. So some kind of distancing from me. Uh, doomism, it's, we're all screwed anyway, there's no point in doing it, and so let's enjoy the party while it's still there. Again, I don't have to pay attention to it, don't have to change anything, we're all screwed, so we can just ignore it. Dissonance, this idea of, I know I'm doing things that are contributing to this problem, but, and then we have a long list of things, it's China's fault, my neighbor drives a bigger car, I didn't go on holidays this year, etc. Whatever the reasons we have to disconnect. Denial as a spectrum of kind of positions that we take, some of that is kind of functional in every day. If we go around staring at this all the time, we can't function, so we need a certain amount of being able to put it on the psychological shelf for periods of time just to get through the day. And then at the other end of that spectrum, we have outright denialism. It's not happening. People who assert that it's a scam or a hoax or something like that. 
So maybe this might account for some of the reasons why when climate news comes at us, instead of reacting as if it's an emergency and making behavioral changes, it just kind of slides by. Bystander effect may be another idea. I'm sure you recognize this concept from social psychology. Three components to it. Diffusion of responsibility. It's got to be someone else's job to take care of this, right? Little old me, I'm not going to have an impact. Evaluation apprehension. Maybe I'll look foolish if I start making behavioral changes or start talking about the fact that the world is about to end. Maybe people will think I'm a silly person by saying that out loud. You know, I've had conversations where I've told people uh, what the UN is saying, total societal collapse, and they kind of chuckle at me and kind of go, <laughs> you know, you're, you're, would you calm down a little bit over there? You know, that's not really happening, is it? So there's an understandable evaluation apprehension. We're worried about how we'll, we'll look if we take it seriously. Why does this keep doing that? Uh, pluralistic ignorance. The idea that we get stuck in the reactions of others. So when there's ambiguity about something, is this really serious? We look around at the behaviors of others. Is everyone acting like it's an emergency? No, they're not. Ah, that's confirmation that indeed it's not an emergency. I don't need to take it seriously, so it slides out of my attention again. So maybe that can help us understand a little bit about why we don't react. So it's, it's extremely hard to keep our attention on this. Timothy Morton, a philosopher, called it a hyperobject something that is so vast in scale, it's really hard to actually comprehend. It has connections with multiple points in the world. It doesn't exist anywhere specifically in time or space, and it doesn't have a beginning uh, or an end. I'm working hard on my acceptance here. So, so it's a really hard thing to stay connected to, and why might that be true? Why is it so hard to pay attention to it? And one aspect of that could be the way that we, and I mean we, society, are talking to each other about it. So why is it that someone's able to sit reading a book on a beach in, in Portugal, this is a photograph taken early this summer, while literally the planet is on fire behind them? Might it be something to do with the way that we are communicating through the media? Melting Arctic ice allows greener shipping. Whoa, there's a confusing statement. France has just observed its earliest 40 degrees C in recorded history. Thank God it's Friday. Does this allow us to think that maybe this isn't that serious? These kind of messages, kind of confusing, enough to just allow a bit of disattention slip in? Happy tears, new airport runway opened. These people look happy about that. Or if we use uh, the car or stop using our cars, we might uh, cut our emissions. Which of those do you pay attention to? And if so, why? Isn't that interesting? I might be really keen on paying attention to the second one now because I'm so keyed up about climate change, but two years ago, maybe I wouldn't have been. So one of the things that really struck me coming out of COVID was how clear, repetitive, and unambiguous the messaging was about this emergency. Why is it doing that? I mean, I'm literally doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> it started, has it? Damn! <laughs> yeah, okay, I won't even touch that now. It's set on automatic? Why would someone do that to me? Okay, uh, we'll just live with it. But just, Where's the IT folk? Are they helping in the background? They are. Sorry about this. So just to talk about COVID, because you saw that slide, and I'll, I'll pick it up when, it, when we get back onto it. Um, it was really hard not to pay attention to COVID, right? It was almost impossible to not know what the problem was and what we were supposed to do. And we're not talking to each other about climate change with that same level of clarity and repetitive messaging. It's easy to not pay attention to climate change for all sorts of reasons. Interestingly, the bystander effect, cognitive dissonance, denial, all of those psychological processes didn't get in the way of us reacting to COVID. Isn't that interesting? Did they just disappear? Or maybe there's something more powerful at play, a, a more potent ingredient that isn't being drawn upon uh, in the case of climate change. 
So why are we not moving? This is a brilliant paper recently published by Stoddard that looks at an analysis of why we're stuck. Uh, 30 years of scientific evidence and warnings, and we're still not bending the emissions curve. And one of the key ingredients, powerful vested interests have developed strategies to both directly discredit the science and climate change, and more subtly delay the need to reduce public reliance on fossil fuels. Why would they do that, do you think? Hmm. Interesting. And they're really good at it. So this is uh, an image going back to the 60s, Hubble, which is now ExxonMobil. Each day, and this is, this is them boasting, they wouldn't do it today, each day Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier, aren't we powerful? Uh, today it's a little more subtle, but nevertheless it's there. Carbon neutral driving. Why are they doing this? Is it because they think we don't believe climate change is happening? I don't think so. Does it activate disattention, create ambiguity, and allow that kind of rumbling inertia to continue? Absolutely. This is part of delay. So when we think about the psychological processes that are at play, we have to put them in social context. Explaining climate change as being caused by psycho psychological phenomenon, somehow inherent to our nature, runs the risk of diverting attention from context. Psychological processes are part of climate change in action, but not its cause. For its cause, we must, must look deeper into social and political power and what is influencing us. Keep in mind that the psychological processes that are also there didn't get in the way of us responding to COVID. So what does this process of change look like? How am I doing with time? Hmm? I've got two minutes. So, one of the ideas is how do we get people to move or how many of us need to be moving in order for the group to change? Because it's quite overwhelming to imagine everyone having to change now. So this is some experimental research that looked at when a group has a consensus decision and you introduce people who want to change uh, people's minds, how many of them have to change their minds before the whole group moves? And they repeated this over and over and over and it turns out it's about 25% repeatedly. In other words, if we get one in four people saying we have to do things differently, that's enough to get a group consensus, the majority moves. One in four feels manageable. One in four friends, one in four fa family members, one in four colleagues, that's manageable. Everyone all at the same time to me feels a bit overwhelming. So, in summary, we are not predetermined to fail in addressing climate change because of some innate psychological processes, cognitive biases, bystander effect, etc. Sustained attention is required for addressing climate change. We are being and have been lied to, misled for decades by vested interests who want business as usual, agri-food industry, airline, fossil fuel companies, et cetera, who are expert at harnessing disattention and delay. Mobilizing groups turns mind to actions, not the other way around, COVID being a good example. And talking about climate change is essential to get us all part of the 25%. Thank you. Thank you so much, Owen, very inspiring. And if you have any questions, just keep them for later. And now we have James Krog, uh, who is gonna talk to us about climate change, education, and an intervention in the Irish school system. Thank you, James. Just trying to avoid using that, I think. <laughs> it's okay. It was just for Owen. <laughs> Um, yeah, so my name is James and I'm going to be presenting the results of some research uh, that myself and Dr. Brophy, who's also in the audience here, uh, did on a climate change education intervention in several secondary schools here in Ireland. Uh, before I start though, I think it's important just to mention the excellent work that different activists are doing at the moment within the education system, in particular the Irish School Sustainability Network. Uh, they're working to bring ch climate change education into the daily school life as it is. But despite this, there's still a lot of, I suppose, confusion and dissonance even amongst teachers and principals and other school staff as to the role that education needs to be playing in the adaptation and mitigation of the effects of climate change. And I think we're all agreed here, and hopefully some of you guys are as well, that psychology, and for me, educational psychology in particular, has a huge role to play, not only in the design of uh, different curricula and material 
on climate change, but also on coping with the effects of uh, climate change anxiety, and also in facilitating, this is for me the most important point, facilitating the paradigm shift towards biospheric values and away from the sort of values that we currently live within and which we know are now unsustainable. Um, okay. So uh, the theoretical model through which I sort of consider my research was the knowledge structure model. And I like this because of the fact that it looks at behavior, attitude, values within a sort of framework of knowledge on three levels. So the first level is just facts about climate change. And when you consider the education system, that's something that they're probably doing already. In geography or science, they learn about the greenhouse effect. They learn about uh, you know, how carbon dioxide or methane or greenhouse gases. Um, the next level, however, is how to act on things like climate change. And then the level above that again in this uh, theoretical framework would be how to act effectively or how to increase your efficacy when it comes to acting on climate change. Um, so within the current education system, you could see that it's sort of you could see how that education, that theoretical framework would fit, tie into that. Um, at the moment, we have a heavy focus on programs like uh, the Green Schools program for primary or secondary uh, level, and they tend to focus more on things like recycling and reducing plastic waste or cons environmental or, sorry, energy or water conservation. And in areas like that, it's more about individual actions or maybe even a school-wide action. Um, what UNESCO would say is that the gold standard of climate change education needs to be looking at more wide-scale collective action too, how as a community and as a society uh, we're encouraging students and teaching them how to change not just their own behaviours but the community behaviours and uh, societal behaviours as well. And then following from that it's about looking at systemic change and encouraging our young people to sort of become active uh, and looking at policy change or uh, going out onto the streets and marching about climate change issues. Um, so, myself and Dr. Brophy did a, a systematic review uh, just prior to this piece of research, and I thought it was important just to mention one or two points from that, particularly because they're not considered, and a lot of people wouldn't consider them as important in education, uh, at the moment anyway. Um, the first one is the venue in which education takes place. A lot of people are focused on, say, whether nature-based activities are as effective or more effective than classroom-based activities. And that is something that's very important, but and no one touched on this already, and um, Anne is going to mention it too. The affect that different activities have is probably as important as the venue in which they take place. And if you want people to change their behavior or to incorporate new values, a lot of that is effectively ba affect based, I suppose. Uh, the second point is that there hasn't been much research done so far on whether, whether climate change education programs or environmental education programs are changing students' values. And by this I'm talking about uh, biospheric values or introducing biospheric values to students. Now, that's changed recently since January. Um, they are talking about it more in the sustainability uh, curriculum. But that's just sort of going, I should have put this in a slide, sorry. Uh, moving away from like the idea that students and all of us as humans are sort of removed or on top of some sort of uh, natural cycle and placing us within it instead. In, uh, here it's some environmental marketer put it as ego versus eco. Uh, but that's basically biospheric values in a nutshell. It's how you respect and relate to nature uh, as well as like how you see the actions you take in your day-to-day -to -day world, day -to -day world. Are they uh, do you consider nature or climate change uh, within that, I suppose? Um, so that was something that I wanted to research uh, in my intervention, and that was the primary purpose of it, I suppose, looking at biospheric values and whether you can introduce through a climate change education module uh, students to biospheric values and whether they'll actually take on some of those values as a result of the education intervention. Um, on top of that, the, on top of that the, the purpose of this intervention was looking at whether or how much or the extent to which there was uh, knowledge, behavior, attitudinal change. 
uh, in relation to uh, climate change and whether that occurred, uh, whether that was impacting biospheric values too. Um, so in order to do all that, uh, we developed a climate change intervention program, which consisted of four modules. It's about a 10 hour program. And like most interventions, a lot of it was copied and pasted from other programs and interventions from Trocara to NASA. And then we sort of incorporated that or localized it, changed names, uh, made it more relevant to the Irish context. And then, uh, yeah, and that was in four main modules. So it went from sort of like the facts about climate change to looking at uh, climate change effects on ecosystems and then who is responsible for it. So you've probably all seen in the, the geography books or the science books the picture of the greenhouse gas, the greenhouse effect, and there'll be smoke going up into the atmosphere and it'll say how, it'll show the sun beaming down lights, but this intervention was more to do with, well, where's that smoke coming from? Who's causing that smoke? Who's responsible for it? How are you contributing to that as well? So that was all explored in this intervention. Um, we also looked then at climate change mitigation and adaptation strategies, uh, right from a family level into school and then into the community. And then students were encouraged to consider how they could uh, improve on uh, adaptation and mitigation within their community. And we came up with different projects for that. And then finally, it was just a little bit about coping with climate change too, in terms of sort of how hopeful do you feel for the future and whether you as an individual can have an effect on, uh, the climate change, on climate change. Now into the design. Um, originally, the research was meant to be a two-group experimental and control group, and it was pre and post, and then a six-month follow-up. Uh, there was a bit of an issue with that, which I'll get to in a minute. But what we did do was uh, go into about seven schools and develop uh, we did a pre-intervention uh, pre survey. Uh, the, the different questionnaires we used for that were on climate behavior intentions, environmental efficacy, worry, hope, and concern about climate change, then environmental values, which is to do with biospheric values, and then knowledge about climate change too. And the issue with the sample was that I used the same, for the control groups, I used the same schools as the experimental groups, but the classes that were in the control group, they heard about the, the climate change education module and they really wanted to take part in it, probably because they got to skip Irish and maths and things, but as a, rather than any interest in climate change. But as a result, their teachers ended up doing the same programs that I had done with the other classes with them. So that obviously contaminated the research and as a result, I wasn't able to use the data from the, the control groups. Um, but we got three data points for seven schools, about 90 students over three points in time. So the, the interventions were in um, March to May and then this, uh, of this year. And then in September, October, we went in and we did the, um, the six month follow up intervention. Uh, the results were interesting. Um, if, it was, if I'd left it at a pre and post, it would have probably looked a bit better but the six month follow up changed a little bit. But uh, directly after the intervention, the students' uh, levels of pro-environmental behavior, knowledge, attitude towards, and biospheric values all increased uh, in relation to like knowledge uh, values about climate change. Um, then in the six month follow up, they had re reverted to what they once were, except for one area, which was biospheric values. Uh, that how much you feel you are within nature and how much you want to act in a way that is, you know, sustainable, I suppose. Uh, that stayed uh, high and that was st statistically significant uh, and it still is. So I suppose that was a positive from it. However, for me, it definitely showed that, and this is relevant to, thanks, this is relevant to the new climate change curriculum that's coming out, the Leave Insert as well, if it's solely based on knowledge in classrooms, even if it's student-centered, and even, it's, even if it's like transformational learning, as they call, it's not really enough, I don't think. It needs to go beyond that. Um, but that leads us into the second point. Uh, one of the schools had the idea that they should write letters to a local uh, government entity and ask them what they're doing on climate change. So 
we started a new intervention based around this, which was basically that the students, uh, so this is secondary to this piece of research, but we're doing it at the moment. Basically, students are planting trees uh, with the help of a local NGO, or a, sorry, a national NGO, uh, the Woodland Trust, and as well as that, they're writing letters to different agencies asking for trees and asking for space to plant them. And it's very clear that their behavior, their intentions about climate change and their biospheric values are all way higher than anything that, uh, than anything that might come about from a classroom intervention. So I'm looking forward to comparing the results of the classroom intervention with the results of the intervention that's based more around action, such as tree planting or letter writing, and seeing how that compares in terms of the biospheric values and behavior. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, James. Very interesting. And now we have Anne Walsh from Maynooth University, who is going to talk to us about ecological identity. Thank you, Anne. OK. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to be here. This is my first time at a PSI conference. And um, I was a member of the BPS for the last 15 or so years. And thanks to Owen here, I'm now a member of the PSI and um, part of the special interest group. So my background is psychology, psychotherapy, politics, and environmental activism. And I wanted to contribute in some way to, um, to helping towards the crisis we're facing, helping alleviate the crisis that we're facing, indeed we're now in. Um, and I had the thought of doing a PhD. And while I was doing a scan of the literature, I came across this concept of ecological identity in a book of the same name. Um, and the, um, written by um, Mitchell Thomas Show, he's an American academic, and he talks about ecological identity is more than the knowledge about our ecosystems, it's the depth of our feeling towards nature, and he focuses very much on introspection, and um, so that driving our commitment to environmentalism. So it's this thing of, am I part of nature, or is it separate from me? It's a little bit like what James was talking about with ego and eco, and um, a deep sense of ecological identity influences our way of being in the world. So I think Leopold puts it really nicely when he talks about land as a commodity or land as a community. And I mean, that's really brought us to the space we're in at the moment. And, you know, all about, you know, I was just talking to somebody about Marx's metabolic rift and whatever. So that detachment for the land and where it has brought us. So Thomas Show sees the development of ecological identity as a process from connectedness to care to commitment. Because we hear, sorry, we hear a lot about um, nature connectedness at the moment and people being connected to nature. But a lot of the time that isn't reciprocal. We can feel connected to nature and the next day we're flying somewhere or we're buying luxury goods. Or we were talking earlier about, you know, people, you know, millionaires and billionaires who, you know, are, are part of this whole, um, capitalist, I suppose, agenda that's going on. They live in the most beautiful places in nature, but yet they're responsible for a huge amount of damage. So even with connectedness, there can be a disconnectedness. But from connectedness and reflection on nature can come care. So there's a value placed on nature. And from that can come, can come commitment, that we take action to respect and protect nature. So why explore this question? Um, sorry, I'm, I'm ahead of myself. I'm looking at the one three. So the seeds of our ecological identity are sown during childhood. So can we reawaken dormant seeds or plant new ones? And because I've worked in organisations and I've been involved in politics, I think it's really important to target change makers because we have to do it individually and collectively, but we also have to get the people at the top to shift perspective in some way. And I just found that this concept of ecological identity might be a way into that. So, um, so again, why explore this question? So, um, sorry, the two screens, there's two screens here, they're confusing me. So, look and persistence play a key role when helping scientists to improve the impact of their work on decision makers. So, I think at this stage we need a little bit more than look and persistence. Um, and, and this, this, I could, when I read this paper, it was like I could feel the frustration of um, the authors. So, 
Um, another one is, as the impacts of climate change worsen, influencing and pro-environmental behaviour is becoming increasingly important. And I think psychology and psychologists are really well placed. And for me, I think that was the frustration with psychology when I, well, you know, I, I went back as a mature student and I did a degree, an undergrad and a master's, was how do I apply this practically in the world, that it's just not a set of theories. Um, and particularly around the area of environmentalism. So I, I, I think that's a really good observation. And then I came across this quote from um, Susan Murphy, when the stakes are life on earth, all else is a diversion. And that to me was like, oh, <laughs> wow. So it was profound. And then I was saying earlier that Thomas Show speaks a lot about introspection. So it's a lovely quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, but real change will only happen when we fall in love with our planet. So it's that depth of feeling. Um, and, you know, and that saving us from the devastat devastating effects of environmental destruction. So moving on from that, so the, I, I haven't even done, I'm at the opposite end that James is. I'm only beginning a PhD in my dotage, um, and James is just finishing. So I've only done a very quick scan of the literature at the moment to see where I'm going. So a factor is associated with a strong ecological identity. Child, childhood immersion in the natural world, recall of childhood memories in nature, uh, perception of disturbed places, Immersion in wild nature, all experiences, um, profound experiences in nature. Family cultural values obviously will influence beliefs, both spiritual and political, and we can see that with Trumpism in the States and climate denial and whatever. Um, access to correct information, obviously. Uh, high levels of empathy and low levels of social dominance. Okay, so there are factors associated with a strong ecological identity. So the areas I'm going to focus on are the three areas that Thomas Show would have um, uh, noticed with his work with environmentalists. He, he was working, teaching in, you know, maybe environmental scientists or, um, sorry, um, yeah, environmental scientists or anybody working in the area, both professionally and as activists. And he, he noticed three main areas. So they came up as childhood memories, uh, the perception of disturbed places, and direct experience or immersion in nature. So the first one, uh, childhood memories. I wouldn't say there's a person in this room that can't go back to a time in their childhood that it was a really happy time they spent in nature. It could have been playing with autumn leaves, it could have been making a camp, it could have been splashing in a local river, whatever it was. And I know I, I do a bit of therapy work as well around trauma therapy, and I haven't met to, to date one person who has suffered trauma that can't go back to a happy childhood place in a uh, place in nature in their childhood and um, so from that um, what I want to do is through semi-structured interviews facilitate the recall of positive and joyful childhood memories with change makers and legislators so I just there's a, just a few papers around that so intentions and decisions can be influenced effectively in a positive way by prompting the recall of emotional memories actually there's lots of papers around it but I'm, I'm just pulling from these three at the moment so getting people to recall um, emotional memories to get you know for more positive and constructive decision making then the recall of childhood memories promotes pro-social behavior and a heightened sense of moral purity and i think in politics today we could do with a heightened sense of moral purity um, not everybody but in some spaces um, and then the care of environmental of the environment in adulthood is associated with positive experiences of nature in childhood. So, so you can see my rationale around bringing up those memories. So the second one is disturbed places. Now I'm sure you've all heard of rare earth, and it's a, it's a group of metals that's in all our you know our smartphones, our computers, our cameras, our electric cars, our solar solar panels. But this is a rare earth mine. So when we talk about CO2 emissions and global warming, I know we do talk about the environmental, or the um, sorry, biodiversity crisis, but this is economic, or sorry, ecological degradation at a huge scale. Can you imagine the communities that maybe once were around that? I think this one is in China. A lot of them are in China. So we're talking about an ideological change as well, um, it, you know, a, a, as well as. Um, it's not just, like I said, about reducing emissions. So the contemplation of disturbed places and what 
Thomas Show did with this is he spoke to people about how they felt about beautiful places in nature that are now disturbed. So it could have been a river that they played in as a child that's now polluted. It could be hedgerows that have now been cut out to make larger fields. So there's no birds in those fields anymore. There's no brambles to collect butterflies, whatever. And, um, you know, Ledo puts it really nicely when he says emotions are a critical source of information for learning. So I'm very, very aware that bringing up you know, these emotions, you know, it, it's a difficult space for people to be in, but it is also a critical source to move forward. So just, again, scanning the, the literature very briefly and looking at uh, Thomas Show's work, we're, we're talking about love, gratitude, awe in the, in the positive side, and then loss, grief, anger, panic, and despair. And just before, after despair, we have hope. Um, but I don't mean a full sense of hope, but it's, it's going through that process first. So that's the contemplation of disturbed places. And then the third one is direct experience. So from, a, from being immersed in nature and having a very raw experience, so it might be somebody you see swimming all the time, and they don't really think about it. They go down, they have their little dip, and they go. But then one day they, they go, water quality is important or I want to give something back here. I'm going to, you know, maybe lobby my local uh, TD on what they're doing about um, marine protected areas or whatever it is. But they get a sense of responsibility from that deep immersion. Or it could be sitting in the woods, you know, like we've got all the, the great American guys that we hear about, John Muir and um, Emerson and all those. But there's, there's lots of other... Uh, great female writers as well, um, and I'll mention one in a moment, but maybe just sitting in the woods and hearing nature speak to you. And I know from a personal experience, it was a huge shift for me um, into activism. I was at a Nature Connection weekend, and we were told on the Sunday morning to go out, and um, we, were to go, we were told to go out and sit in, in um, nature just for a few moments and um, reflect. And I was kind of thinking, God, years ago I would have been in mass with my kids or something like this. And I looked down and there was an ivy on the ground. And all of a sudden, the communion prayer came into my head. The work of the, uh, um, sorry, uh, the fruit of the vine and the work of human hands. And it was like, ah, we're meant to be in communion with nature. So, and Zhao, there's a really good study from Zhao, and it, it, it's, it's all experiences in nature enhance the feeling of connection to reduce social dominance orientation and increase the willingness to make personal sacrifice. So I want to explore that with people. And then, that's just a lovely quote from a lady called Robin Wall Kiminer. She's Native American, she's a professor of botany. Paying attention acknowledges that we have something to learn from intelligences other than our own. Listening, standing witness creates an openness to the world in which the boundaries between us can dissolve in a raindrop. And I'm just going to leave you with a few lines from the first poem that was ever said on the land of Ireland by um, Oscar Elga, but I'm leaving you with it in English from the great poet of the Milesians, Amargan, and you can see how we're part of nature. Thank you, Anne. Uh, lovely presentation. So uh, now we move on from uh, ecological identity to uh, the concept of climate justice, and we have Dr. Amy Brogan and Dr. Elaine Rogers. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? This is a big room. Okay. Um, hi, everybody. Let me click forward so you can look at that. My name is Amy Brogan. I'm a senior clinical psychologist in the HSC and Stuart, and I'm presenting with Elaine from University of Limerick today. Um, so today we're going to introduce the concept of climate justice, which you may or may not be familiar with. I'm going to talk about a few examples of climate justice in action that you might have seen in the media or the common discourse, and then most crucially, what we as psychologists um, can do to support a climate justice perspective. So what is climate justice? Um, climate justice refers to the unequal and unjust impact of climate change on a number of different groups. That includes children, vulnerable groups, and indigenous populations, and the concept of a just transition, which Oren mentioned earlier. So children. Children, we know, will bear up to 80% of the physical impacts of climate change. They're also more vulnerable to climate change because they're still developing, and they're also the group most likely to worry about climate change, which we'll talk about later in relation to climate anxiety. 
Vulnerable groups um, references people with disabilities or the elderly who, in the case of climate events, have the least capacity to cope with those events. Then indigenous groups, probably the most significant among this is people living in the global south, who because of their geography are most likely or are being most impacted by climate. So because of their lower latitude and altitude, they've been affected by extreme heat, drought, but also inundation and flooding. And they're affected by what we call the double inequality of climate change. So they have done the least to cause climate change, but are most affected, and because of their developing nature and their developing in infrastructure, have the least capacity to respond to those events. And I'm sure lots of people would have heard about the kind of fund to support those countries as part of COP this week. Okay, and then a just transition, as Oren mentioned earlier, is probably really relevant from an Irish context, because it refers to those people who are employed in industries that are really reliant on fossil fuel and will need support um, and fairness in moving away and like ultimately radicalising those industries, so agriculture and peace, for example, in Ireland. Okay, so a couple of examples of climate justice in action, because this is happening. So um, lots of you are familiar with Greta Thunberg, so she would support the youth-led activism around the lack of action on climate change and the impact on young people through her Fridays for Future campaign. Then in an Irish context, um, I'm not sure if people heard of Climate Case Ireland. So this was a group of solicitors slash barristers who took the Irish government to the Supreme Court for the lack um, of specification of the, the mitigation plan. So basically saying that it was insufficient in that it didn't specify how we were going to meet the national transition objective. And they won. And that led to a revision of that plan and the recent sectoral binding targets. So you probably would have heard of the agricultural targets and the kind of controversy around how much of reduced emissions sectoral binding targets. So it's an example of climate justice in action that had a real tangible impact in terms of us having specificity about how we're going to meet our goals in those areas. So looking more internationally, there's currently a case with the European Court of Human Rights where a group of youths in Portugal have taken Portugal and 32 other states um, to the European Court of Rights arguing that their lack of action around climate change is a human rights violation and that's currently with the High Chamber. We cannot speak about the concept of climate justice without speaking about Mary Robinson who coined the term and her work, her tremendous work, has led to the recent UN resolution in July of this year to the right to a clean, healthy, and sustainable environment as a human right. And she's so eloquent in this area, and she would speak to the layers of injustice of something she would talk about. And within that, she would speak about how climate change, one of the layers of injustice, is about women. Because women in developing countries already have less rights and bear more of the burden at home, and so they will be more in, uh, impacted by climate events. And she really specifically calls on women in the West to do what we can to support women globally in that regard. So what can psychologists do? Um, so a bit like Own, I came at this um, as a mammy. This is not my uh, core business, climate change. I work in a very different aspect of psychology. Um, but I think that there is lots that we can do. We come to psychology because we have a moral obligation or a sense of duty around helping others, particular aspects of society or a system. And that is at the essence of climate change. So I hope that you can go away today with some ideas of the things that you, you can and you should do it as a psychologist to support climate change. So I'm gonna speak about direct intervention and climate anxiety and then I'm gonna hand over to Elaine. So in terms of direct intervention, we're likely to be involved in kind of an acute and a chronic way in supporting people. So we know that with increases in extreme weather events, which we know are associated with depression, anxiety and PTSD, we're likely to be involved around supporting people with that distress, either internationally or through climate refugees in Ireland, which will be part of the future. And from a more chronic perspective, as I mentioned, young people are the group most likely to worry about climate change. Um, so that they're experiencing what's called climate anxiety, which is anxiety in, in face of the threat, of the existential threat of climate change. 
So there's not much consensus in the literature about how to conceptualize climate anxiety from a mental health standpoint. So some would argue that is a kind of a pop culture trend. Some would say, is it an adaptive response? Anxiety is an alarm mechanism. And if the threat is real and the anxiety is proportionate, is it an adaptive response for survival? And others then would argue it's a clinical disorder that needs treatment. So we're kind of in a space where we're at risk of over pathologizing normal responses or maybe under reacting to the real mental health impacts of climate um, anxiety. Um, there's some research to say that collective action rather than individual action is supportive and I think that's the symposium is probably an example of that today in helping climate anxiety um, but from a justice perspective what we need to think about is which nations are best positioned to respond to the mental health impacts of climate change. Okay, handing over to Elaine. So I'm just going to pick up and carry on about some of the ideas that we can think about doing. And I suppose I've come to climate change. It's not my core business either. I don't think it's any of our core business. It's um, something I'm relatively new to. But um, also, uh, as a parent, it's, it's hugely important. And coming to it with a human rights perspective, I suppose, what we, what we know about uh, climate change is that what we know about at-risk populations in general is the disparity seeping to every facet of life, in, uh, 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 from health, professional safety, social life, and the effects of climate change are borderless and they exacerbate those disparities. So there is a piece around people in the global south really experiencing a much greater um, effect of, of, of change and there's, uh, but also within our own, you know, we, we talk about human rights internationally, we also talk about human rights at home and people within our own environment, within our own home, who have, who have less, as, as Amy has pointed out, people with, who have disabilities, who have mental health difficulties, who are living on the margins already, um, and the effect, the, the greater experiencing those greater effects. What can we do as psychologists? And, and I don't know if anyone was around last night and, and saw the documentary on PSI in the 50 years of, of PSI. And one of the, I suppose, one of the impressions I think we were all left with was the, the role the, that the PSI has played in, in advocating and in advocacy. And I suppose for those of us who, who train in, in the scientist practitioner model, <clears throat> this is what we're schooled in for, for, for our careers and what our, what our training is founded on. But we can be open to the idea, perhaps, that we can, we can broaden that model, and that we can broaden that scientist-practitioner model to a scientist-practitioner advocate model. And this is a model that people, I don't know, maybe are, are familiar with at this point. It comes from the counselling psychology literature originally. But we're increasingly seeing the role of psychology um, playing a role in advocacy, and advocacy for ourselves, for seldom-heard voices, and for a psychological perspective, for advocating for um, psychological for psychological science, and, and for the benefit of that, and we're, sorry, we're saying to um, organisations. So when we talk about advocacy, sometimes we talk about the levels at which we can advocate, and whether that's within our own practice, within our own lives, within our own services, within our, our, our communities, or whether that's advocating at, um, at as, as a group level, at, at an organisation, and advocating. Um, at government level and even perhaps internationally. And there's groups setting up and, or, and being organised and, and progressing this idea as psychologists, as advocates. Um, one of the things that we, we like to think of is, is climate change as a human rights issue. Um, and the idea that climate change is one of the greatest threats to human rights for our generation, posing a serious fundamental, right, fundamental threat to the right to life, health, food, and adequate standards of living across the road, across the world. Um, there was a, this is an interesting survey. So this is an interesting survey that was done by the United Nations Development Programme and, and the University of Oxford. The sample was 1.2 million, which is a huge sample, um, and it's called the People's Climate Vote. It's the largest survey of public opinion on climate change ever conducted. And really, what they found is that there's 
there's an appetite for change. So it's 50, 50 countries covering 56% of the world's population. There's a huge appetite for change. There's a huge appetite um, around the world to see, to see us doing things differently. But for some reason, there's been a big lag between the science, which we know is accepted, and you know, we're now talking about adaptation to climate change, not is climate change really happening, there's been this big lag um, for 30 years or more, and the policy hasn't, the implementation of the policy hasn't happened. And I wonder about a role for psychology in this. I wonder about a role in psychology in understanding why implementation isn't happening, and what it is it about the values, the beliefs, and the worldviews um, that, that we're not getting. And th there's a complexity here because the discourse around human rights and climate justice, the discourse around fairness and responsibility has been at the centre of climate change for, for, from the beginning, but it hasn't had an effect. It hasn't been enough to persuade richer companies, to, richer countries to contribute to, um, to helping uh, countries in need. And I wonder what that's about. And there's, I suppose, ideas now that maybe we need to, in addition to progressing ideas around uh, human rights focus and keeping those ideas, maybe we also need to be appeal appealing to people's ideas around self-interest and what are those values. I've been signaled here to move on, so I'm going to, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to move on. <laughs> there is ideas that we have around supporting a just transition in Ireland. So we are an agricultural uh, dependent country. Um, I'm from Dublin originally, and I'm used to a public transport service. If I'm in Dublin, I hop on the bus and I, I travel around. I live in Ennis now, and it's not possible for me to get a bus. To, uh, um, and for the last 20 years, it hasn't been possible for me to get public transport to work. So there's a big discrepancy between urban life and, the con and, and rural life. For those of us who are beyond the pale, it's very difficult to access. You need a car. We, in our household, we tried to have one car, and it just doesn't work. If you're working, childcare, so there's a real need for um, an understanding of the different the perspectives that people are coming from, and how we're going to manage our society, and the way that we support families, and the way we support people to go about their day-to-day -day business and earn their living in a way that's just. So as a concluding thought, I suppose we are all fans here, I think, of Mary Robinson. And as a concluding thought, uh, we, we thought it would be nice to, to make reference to Mary Robinson's ideas around that we have responsibility to move in the direction the Paris has given us. And we see COP27 now, um, and, and this, this symposium is so well-timed. Um, and it's to, move, to move towards a world that is fair and inclusive and that leaves no one behind. Um, and we can do it, and we will have a much better and more equal world if we do it. And we propose that psychology can play a, pl play a part in that, can play a part in creating a world that's fair and inclusive, and can play a part in a world that leaves no one behind. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, thank you, Amy. Now it's me. You need to bear with me because I had a brilliant idea of falling off a bike just before the conference. Yeah. Uh, very well, thank you for sticking with us. It's a bit hard going through five presentations all in one go, but indulge me just for a little bit. So um, my name is Marika. I'm a lecturer in applied psychology at the School of Psychology in University College Cork. I am an environmental psychologist, and today I just present um, briefly on an empirical study that I conducted with Cork City Council and colleagues in the Center for Research into Atmospheric Chemistry related to attitudes towards air quality and air quality information-based interventions. So why, as a psychologist, am I, have I ended up in, into air pollution? Uh, well, mainly because air pollution is a human-made problem. Um, it's a problem that is strong, strongly linked to the changes that we're seeing in the climate, and it's a problem that has a strong impact on our health. And indeed, if we look at the uh, recent reports, for instance, from the World Health Organization, 
we can see that most of us live in places where we breathe air that is actually not very good for us. And just in Ireland, uh, if we look at the latest report from the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, pollutants such as particulate matter have been associated with around 1,300 premature deaths. And so it is, it is a huge problem. Now, I apologize. There are two pollutants listed there, and I switched what they are related to. So particulate matter is mostly related to home heating behaviors, and NO2, nitron dioxide, is associated mostly with transport. And they are the main drivers of air pollution in Ireland. And so a lot of that is down to what we do as individuals, as households, with regards to how we travel and what we do in our home, particularly for heating. And so if we look at the um, um, solutions proposed by the EPA to kind of tackle and promote good air quality, a lot of those solutions are around raising awareness, educating people to the risks associated with air pollution, and try and promote behavioral, uh, behavioral change. And indeed, as psychologists, we have a lot to do with ideas around attitudes and behavior. So if we look at models of uh, risk perceptions or behavioral change, uh, they're mostly centered around the idea that the way we perceive risk, we apprise risk, of the attitudes that we have towards a certain uh, aspect of our life may drive our, intentional, um, our intentions and then our behavior. So it is very important that we look at how people feel about a certain problem, how they perceive a certain problem, to try and tailor potential behavioral interventions. And indeed, this is something that Cork City Council has been very keen uh, to do. So Cork City has, is one of the first in Ireland to have a clean air strategy. And uh, we came on board for UCC to try and understand attitudes towards air quality in general, but also towards potential information-based interventions, so campaign and, and intervention. So I'm going to briefly describe two studies that I've con conducted as part of this uh, collaboration. Uh, the first study looked at um, uh, the general public's views on um, air quality, but also on potentially receiving air quality alerts based on forecasting. So similarly to how you receive a weather forecast, there is modeling uh, systems that allow you to get a, a prediction of what the air quality might be in the next two days. And these are usually, they're used in certain countries as preventative measures, particularly for more vulnerable, uh, more vulnerable groups. And the second study, so in the first study we had around 500 people who took part in the survey. The second study was more localized, so we work with two schools, uh, primary schools in Cork, and we look at perceptions, once again, of air pollution and air quality outside the school, a pick-up and drop-off time in particular, involving uh, parents, caregivers, and school staff. But also we ask people how they would feel about having air quality sensors, uh, so monitors basically, installed outside the schools and receiving information from those air quality, air quality monitors. And so very briefly looking at the uh, finding, the main findings, uh, we ask a number of things. We ask about level of concern, perception of risk, knowledge of air pollutants, engagement with air quality related information. And overall, across the two studies, we found moderate levels of concern. So people, when asked, people were saying that air pollution to them is an important uh, risk factor for, for health. Uh, but perception of air quality, either outside the home or outside the school, varied significantly, either across uh, different demographics, so that we saw variations by age, uh, but we also saw variations based on how people travel. So um, participants in these two studies who travel by car were those with the, who perceived air quality as the best, like highest rating uh, uh, compared to people who, who walk. And overall, we found low levels of engagement with air quality information, but surprisingly also low awareness of important pollutants. So if you look at the graph, uh, I don't know where the click is there. Yay! If you look at this bar chart, you see this long red bar chart? So this is the, the percentage of people in the school survey who told us that they never heard of particulate matter uh, before, which I found was very interesting because you will think that this is a pollutant that most people will be familiar with, and this is telling me that half of the people in, um, who 
completed this survey didn't know uh, what this would be. So this speaks to me to a need for education and, and awareness. Uh, we also ask people to think about, you know, who is more responsible for air quality either outside your home or outside the school. And unsurprisingly, we found that people tend to put more responsibility onto others' behaviors rather than their own behaviors. So if you look at this bar chart at the bottom, the blue bars are um, our own activity, my own activities. So this is the forecast survey. So this is thinking about households' activities, particularly heating activities. And you can see that the blue bar is the lowest consistently. So this is on the vertical axis, you will have the negative impact from no negative impact at all to very strong negative impact and own activities are rated the lowest, whereas other activities were considered more, uh, more impactful. So an interesting uh, perception of potential causes of uh, air pollution. We then ask people to tell us a little bit how they, they will feel about the two interventions that I described before, either receiving air quality um, forecast alerts or having information on air quality outside the school from, from sensors. And people were had overall positive views, although most people told us, and these were qualitative questions, that the main benefit that they, they will see will be about raising awareness and educating people. Most people would expect, uh, were telling us that they would expect a low behavioral impact. And you can see a little excerpt of that uh, in this extract from a participant who said that as much as I would like to reduce my diesel consumption in order to improve air quality, this is my children's means of transport to school, therefore there is no alternative. Now, it's very easy here to point finger and say this person is in denial, but the reality is that choices, certain choices are very complex and, and there are realistic barriers that people experience and this has been touched upon uh, already in previous presentations. So it, the, the picture is a little more, bit more complex, particularly if we want to use interventions aimed at changing behavior. And, and, and we saw that different uh, categories of people were expressing different uh, needs and different barriers, and, and I think that these are very important. But what we found also interesting what the, was this need uh, that, that emerged in, in our participants' responses about receiving information that is not just about risk and about the threats and about having negative messaging, but framing the message focusing on agency, on self-efficacy. So if you're sending me alerts, if you're telling me about the air quality outside my, my child's school, tell me what I can do about it. Give me a potential solution. So if there are communication strategies, don't just focus them on fear messaging, but also give me some form of coping uh, with it, which I found uh, was, uh, w was interesting. And also we asked people how they would like to receive this kind of information, to engage with information. So we asked this question along the lines of the EAST framework, so looking at whether people would prefer ease of access, attractiveness, sociability of timeliness, and ease of access was the most strongly preferred by our respondents. So people would prefer, the participants we had would prefer to receive the information that, rather than having to look for that, that information, whether it is an alert or information about the school or quality sensors. So how was this? Research, while well, were these findings, which were driven by psychological kind of theories and models of risk perception, uh, used. Um, so the results have informed the cleaner strategy in the sense that we were able to, even though this is a small local study, uh, research actually, there are two studies, uh, we, we were able to make some recommendations with regards to how perhaps communication strategies need to be optimized and focus not just on outlining risks, but also looking at um, uh, self-efficacy and empowering people, but also the need for ease of access. Interestingly enough, we asked people how they would like to hear about air quality alerts, and we gave different options, online media and traditional media, and we were expecting some kind of age trend where um, um, or all the groups would prefer traditional media, and actually everybody is up for a for an app, everybody wants an app where they can see their air quality alerts. So the digital interventions might actually be uh, the way to go, independent of uh, the different groups. 
And, but also because of the complexity in needs and potential barriers, um, something that came strongly from these studies was the need for the local authority to engage in a meaningful way with local communities in order to find solutions, if that is, that is the aim. And lastly, the last recommendation we made was that to actually test behavior try and do some research to test actual behavior. We know from research that self-reported behavior oftentimes uh, does not align with objective behavior. So it would be interesting to see what kind of impact interventions of this type may have in terms of objective behavior, and maybe what kind of uh, how showing people that impact, that objective impact, might change uh, their attitudes. So that's all for me. Thanks very much. And because this symposium was about what psychologists can do, we thought that we could leave for our Q&A this lovely slide from Owen. Thank you, Owen, for agreeing to sharing on a list of potential actions, these um, different actions that could be taken into account. And there, if you want to know more about our special interest group, you can scan the QR code, and that will bring you to our web page. So, Thanks, everyone, and I'll open it now to questions, if you have any questions. Yes? I welcome the introduction of a new SIG, I suppose that's an optimistic thing, but my <laughs> pessimistic remarks are this. One is about uh, terminology. Uh, as far as I understand it, the oil companies who have been denying this issue for years, at least 20 years, <clears throat> they changed the terminology from global warming, which sounded a bit threatening, to climate change, and that's the term that seems to be used a lot these days. I was listening to Greta Thunberg recently, and she was talking about, uh, well, climate crisis, we might call it crisis, but everything's a crisis these days, so that crisis isn't, doesn't really emphasize it. So perhaps we should be using words like emergency or the assonance of climate catastrophe, because I think that's what it is. That's the first comment. Uh, the second comment is just that I, I've been watching a, a nice little current affairs program by John Simpson on BBC Two. It's called Unspun World. And at the end of the most recent program, he just threw in sort of casually a comment by the environment minister of Gabon, a small African state, who said that there would be no change in the rich countries until their populations start to die in large numbers. That's it. Thank you. Those are two very important remarks, and actually both terminology and also this idea of Psychological distance is something that we've been discussing a lot in our own special interest group. I wonder if there is someone who wants to respond to that or add anything. I'm looking at Owen. <laughs> Just start using that. Oh, yeah, thank you. Um, terminology, yeah, it's a rumbling debate. It's been going on for a long time, and you're absolutely accurate to note that global warming was changed to climate change by the oil companies. They also championed the notion of the, the carbon footprint um, so that it became our problem and not theirs. Um, I, I wonder if it's the elevation of the message rather than the words itself, though, uh, because you could still have climate crisis or catastrophe being used but if they're not being spoken by the right people in the right ways, in the right places, frequently enough, um, maybe it's not, that's not the issue. Uh, so the, the language around COVID, for example, wouldn't have mattered so much because it was being spoken by all of the political leaders in the same way, ubiquitously, repetitively, and we, we couldn't get away from knowing about it, whether they called it this, that, or the other. So it is valid, but I'm not sure it's as valid as um, the political weight that's given to the commentary. In terms of um, will we change uh, or not, don't have a crystal ball, but um, it does seem to be that 
Um, there are some very powerful people in the world who are willing to drive us right off a cliff uh, in service of short-term financial gain or stability, whatever way you want to put that. And that those people in the global south and eventually all poorer people will be the ones who will pay the price for that. And ultimately that denial that they sense of exceptionalism maybe or narcissism or whatever keeps them believing that they're somehow uh, not implicated in the consequences of climate change uh, will be found out. The question is, can that be undone before it's, it's too late for um, most of what needs to be saved? And on that, uh, it's not a black and white too late. There is uh, a kind of a binary piece to this that we get stuck in, which is, is it too late or not? The question is, is it too late for what? It's too late now to stop the consequences of the warming that's currently baked in, but it's not too late to stop the consequences of the warming that we would further increase. Uh, have, we, have we gone too far for 1.5? That's a hot debate at the moment. Some people say yes. Have we gone too far for two? No, we haven't, and that's still salvageable. Is that important? Absolutely, because some people say that that has physical tipping points in it that bring us automatically to three and possibly four, although, again, that's debated. Um, so every tenth of a degree really matters. Um, there are people who will drive us right off a cliff. The government is complicit, and everyone has a role to play. And, yeah, it's pretty grim at times. Yeah, thanks, Ronnie. Thank you, Anya. Maybe. Yeah, I just want to add to the oscillation piece. <clears throat> I think we can all strongly relate to that here. Um, and I think the challenge for us as psychologists is we're good at staying with difficult feelings. And it's kind of about supporting others to stay engaged with a really difficult topic. And that can mean like respite and breaks at times because, you know, some of the literature would show that activism is tricky, right? Because you've got to stay with the material more. <laughs> You're reading about it more. Um, so I think that's a real... You put the nail on the head for psychologists. How do we support others to stay engaged with a really difficult topic? Thank you. Is another question there? Yeah, uh, just, uh, just an observation I've kind of had from a lot of the, the talk around mental health and, and climate change. And something that always that strikes me is that we're, we're very quick to talk about climate anxiety. And I'm, I'm glad it was, it was raised there that the, kind of, the way it's a bit contested. Because one of the things I think of when, when it comes to like young people and the school strikes and all this kind of stuff, that that's a message of anger. <laughs> and it's a very healthy anger. But we're so quick to, to talk about people in a way that, like about young people in a way that they're disempowered and that they, that they don't like have, as in if people are too anxious or avoidant about this whole thing, that nothing's gonna happen and no one's gonna do anything. But actually young people are showing that you know, they want action and, they're, and engaging in a kind of healthy anger around that is something that could be cultivated a lot more. And I just, I wonder like with all the conversations people have like between parents and children, like around, around the anxiety that they're feeling, that how much are we actually helping parents even in trying to, to let their young people be angry and feel heard and feel validated with that, instead of sitting in a way that they don't feel like they're heard at all and that they can't uh, take any action on it. And um, so I just, yeah, I just think as, as we talk about mental health coming into this in the future, that's something I really hope that we start to engage with that anger a little bit more and don't talk about it as if it's a bad thing. Thank you, absolutely, very important observation. And I think it speaks to the question of who has a voice and how much we allow for that, for that voice to, to be heard. I wonder if Amy or Elaine want to, or anybody else want to touch on this. I'm just looking at the two of you because we're talking about climate justice, but James, indeed. Um, I was just frantically nodding to, to what you were saying, yeah. Um, like, I think everything you said is totally valid. I think as a culture, maybe we're not terribly good at being angry and staying with that. So there might be a cultural overlay on that. And then as a parent myself, I think there, I, you know, when I work with families, there can be a tendency to take away difficult feelings that parents often have the parent challenge of how do you s stay with your child's distress and move them through that to a place of problem solving or action or whatever. So um, I am totally in agreement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, if I could, I could just add to that for a moment, because I think, I mean, obviously anger is a very positive driving force if it's used in the right way, but I know James had mentioned he's doing some work with planting trees. 
So it's actually doing something very practical that you can see. So you're not left with these young people on the street saying nobody's listening. It's also I'm doing something else as well, something very tangible. And we know the scientific evidence around even touching the soil. I mean, there's a huge amount. I mean, humus, humanity, you know. Um, so we get our kids right back down into nature as well. So I think for parents, that's a powerful tool because they can actually encourage their kids to get involved in stuff like that. So. Right, just another element of the mental health pieces. At the moment, um, as psychologists, I suppose, we're responding to um, to supporting refugees from war and from or fleeing from from different things and we will very soon be looking at uh, supporting refugees from climate who are cl climate refugees and um, so we have the island nations or the, the ocean states i think there was um, a conference there a couple of years ago down in cork and john kerry was over in simon coverley and there was a whole piece and we had representatives there from the what they call the, the ocean states so people who are literally looking at their lands being submerged underwater and so you're looking at whole communities, whole countries being displaced. We're seeing this now, droughts, uh, floods, all the time. And, and so I suppose from a mental health perspective, I suppose uh, as psychologists, we have a role then in supporting people in adjusting to that and, and finding new ways of living and new places to live at a very practical level. Thank you. We need to close soon, but we have time for one more question. Is that in relation to the tree planting program? Yeah, there's, there's groups already doing it, but for ours, it's at the pilot program stage now. But thankfully, we have schools and we have charities that are interested in working together. And it ties in with what uh, the gentleman behind you was saying too. Like, the, how do you translate the emotions into action? And what do you do with that? And you see, uh, actually, interesting enough, it's not anger or even anxiety that most children feel when you talk to them in the schools, most students feel. Uh, they're sort of saying, why is this on us? That's their overwhelming feeling. It's just like, you did this, why do we have to solve everything? Why are you putting this on us? So you can, we can work with that and the anger and even the anxiety too, just to say, well, look, these are all the feelings we feel about it. How are we coping? What sort of meaning are we going to give to this? And where are we going to go with that meaning? Uh, and channel it into uh, you know, productive activities in one sense, uh, so that they feel that they're... I suppose, on the good end of things rather than the bad end of things. And I, I don't mean to reduce it to that black or white thinking, but a lot of the time that's, you know, if they can take an action that allows them to feel they're part of the solution, that's far more healthy for, for them than if you could sit and talk with them and talk about the emotions even of it. That, that's what it seems to me now, but I mean, there's probably lots of other perspectives on it. I didn't count to anxiety in school age uh, youngsters and you know the whole locus of control thing that if we can go from just thinking and being overwhelmed to uh, doing yeah, that something really important change yeah um I find just even sitting here and listening to the other presentations I find it's quite empowering because you hear other people's perspectives on it, but you also hear different actions and strategies and ways to take action. And I mean, you know, we're, I, well, I was talking about doing that in the classroom and providing students with different actions that can do activities, but like, it's the same by all of us being here, talking about this collectively and listening. You know, we're coming up with our own solutions and now it's just about moving from that attitude or talking about them into something a little bit more. And, maybe start acting a little bit more on, on these issues that we all know are very much there and present. Thank you so much. I need, unfortunately, to stop the discussion, but I think we're all staying around for during the refreshment time, so you can grab us even after this. So thank you very much for staying with us, and we hope you enjoyed the presentations, and thanks to all the presenters. Thank you.